happy sounds. And for this, I will walk, I will you, walk through you through a typical, a typical lesson. lesson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank, and you, thank very you very much for giving up your time, up your time this afternoon, this afternoon to attend this session, session on, on phonics. phonics. My name, My name is Del, and I'm the, and I'm the regional teacher trainer, trainer and academic consultant for Macmillan Education, and I'll be, and I'll be delivering the session to you, to you today. I'm based, I'm based here in beautiful, beautiful Thailand. Thailand. Today, today we are revisiting phonics. phonics. My, colleague, My colleague John Croft delivered, delivered a session earlier in the year on phonics, and my plan today is to recap and expand upon that session. We will look at what phonics is and how useful it is for students to be able to learn to read. We will then look at a systematic program of teaching phonics called Snappy Sounds. And for this, I will walk you through a typical lesson and show you how the phonics can be delivered to our learners effectively. So grab a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, or your preferred beverage, and we will be with you very soon. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for giving up your time this afternoon to attend this session on phonics. My name is Del, and I'm the regional teacher trainer and academic consultant for Macmillan Education, and I'll be delivering the session to you today. I'm based here in beautiful Thailand. Today, we are revisiting phonics. My colleague John Cruft delivered a session earlier in the year on phonics and my plan today is to recap and expand upon that session. We will look at what phonics is and how useful it is for students to be able to learn to read. We will then look at a systematic program of teaching phonics called Snappy Sounds. And for this I will walk you through a typical lesson and show you how the phonics can be delivered to our learners effectively. So grab a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, or your preferred beverage, and we will be with you very soon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear and see me okay? Hi, Excellent. Okay, I can see we have a, uh, I'm looking at the, the uh, names here. We've got uh, people from Thailand. Just, just type in the chat box, where are you, uh, where are you from? Where, where are you uh, sitting today? I know, I know we have some, some Cambodia, Indo, Vietnam, Jakarta, Myanmar. Okay, some we have across the re Ecuador, wow, across the region and beyond. That's fantastic. Okay, great. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I hope you got a chance just to see my uh, my short little introduction. But my name is Del, uh, and as I said, I'm the regional teacher trainer and academic consultant for Macmillan Education. Uh, some of you might know me already. I'm pretty sure that I recognize some of the names. Uh, so if I have met you before, then uh, hi again. And uh, if this is our first time meeting, uh, fingers crossed we'll be able to see each other in the future face to face. So let's get started. So a little bit about uh, Macmillan just to start with. So I'll let you read this slide yourself. A couple of years ago, we celebrated our 175th anniversary, so over 175 years of uh, leading the world in publishing um, and working with uh, educators just like yourselves. And we work in three main areas, uh, achieving these, uh, these goals within those areas. So we work in ELT, so English Language Teaching, which is pretty much what you are, I would imagine you are doing. We also work in what we call uh, international curriculum, so IC, which is uh, working with uh, schools that teach maths and science and literacy. Um, and we also work in higher education as well. Now, today's uh, session is all about phonics. And the, the, um, the materials that you're going to see today actually cross over. So 
could be used uh, with first language learners or second language learners, but certainly those learners that are, that are uh, basically learning how to read, hence the reason why we are teaching phonics or, and how I can teach phonics effectively, efficiently, in an engaging way. All right, so I'm going to do today's session um, as a kind of story um, with a teacher who has a problem and we're going to uh, help her solve this problem. Um, before I start, however, I should just mention about um, any technical issues that might occur. So you'll see that my name is in the, uh, in the box there twice as the presenter, and that's just in case any of the computers uh, go down. If my internet goes down, then there's nothing I can do about it, but Daisy, who is uh, our uh, Macmillan Asia representative in China, who's helping us today in our marketing team, she will be able to come on and, uh, and solve the problem until I get my internet back on. So don't worry if I drop off, stay where you are. Let's get started. So we're going to start with a story. Now you can see on the screen there I've written in the phonetic script. Now don't be worried about that. This is just the name of the story. Can someone just type in the chat box, what's the name of the story? What does the phonetic script say? Yeah, thank you very much, Les. The phonics story, that's right. But don't be confused between the phonemic script and phonics itself. Um, this is the last time you will see me use the phonemic script uh, in this uh, presentation. And um, I just wanted to bring it up just to let you know that they are very closely related. Um, phonics is often used interchangeably with phonetics. Um, but the term is different. Phonics is more a method of teaching reading instruction for school children. Um, and a simplified form of phonetics, if you like. So this is a story about three main characters. On the left-hand side, you can see a teacher, and her name is Olive. So here we have teacher, let me just pull my, here we have teacher Olive. In the middle, we have Snappy. And on the right, we've got teacher Bob. Okay, so these three characters are going to lead us through our story with me, as a narrator and probably jumping into the story at some point. So let's see how we go. So meet Olive. Olive's a lovely woman. She wants to help her students, but she doesn't really know where to start. She's recognized they have problems when they're reading. So how can she help her students? Now, if you were in the teacher's room with Olive, what advice would you give her? Where should she start? What, what would you say to Olive if you work with Olive? Let me know what you think in the chat box. Okay, so we've got introducing phonic sounds, sounds of letters. With flashcards, good. So, we're talking about resources that are available. Teaching the alphabet. Okay, and we're introducing some guided reading as well. Okay. Conversation, wow, okay. Words divided into syllables. Okay, so, and some form of assessment. There we go, Nathan. Yeah. Oh, hi, Nathan. How are you? I hope you're very well. A big shout out to Nathan. Nathan's already using uh, snappy sounds, which is what we're going to look at today. But thank you very much, Nathan, for your time. Pronunciation, songs. Okay, good, good, good stuff. All right, so remember Olive really wants to help them with their reading, okay? So bear that in mind. That's what we're looking at today. So she's heard about phonics and she asks in the teacher's room, can anybody help? Now, unfortunately, not many people in the teacher's room know anything about phonics. So she's wondering what to do. There's also one teacher in the teacher's room. And I'm, I'm sure we all know this teacher who is very negative, who brings it all down, who 
will not give us any help. All right. And this teacher is called Bob. All right. And Bob says teaching phonics is a waste of time. I've tried it and it didn't help me at all. Now, maybe Bob comes from a background where he wasn't taught phonics or wasn't taught how to read using phonics. And actually, when I was looking at this session today and thinking more about phonics and learning myself, I was trying to think all the way back whether I learned to read using phonics. And I, and I did. I remember teachers telling me about the curly k and the kicking k. So the C. In, but you the C, I can't, I'm doing it backwards, but the C and the K and how they have the same sounds. Um, so I was lucky enough to be taught using phonics. And I think if you have been taught using phonics, it does help you. And you can see the benefits of that. Um, but maybe Bob didn't. Maybe Bob has tried phonics. Maybe he had a, a class of children that couldn't read. He tried phonics. It didn't work. And he has a negative idea of phonics. So let's try and help Olive, help Bob to teach using phonics. So Olive has to think about it. No one in the teacher's room knows what phonics is. Bob's really negative, but she still wants to help her children. So she has a thing. She's got a growth mindset. Now, growth mindset, I'm sure you know, is super important. It's not, um, it's about getting better at things, doing things to make yourselves better, uh, not taking no for an answer, finding out things for yourself. So she thinks I'm going to find out stuff for myself. And she also has this idea as well about phonics. As what Bob said, that phonics didn't help me, didn't help Bob. Bob's not the most important person in the classroom. The students are the most important people in the classroom. He never mentioned his students. So what does Olive want? Olive wants a program that will develop her students as well as herself as a teacher. So like any good teacher, Olive starts her quest. Now she gets online and she's typing away and she's looking around for phonics programs and she's bombarded. Phonics here, phonics there individual websites if you google phonics you'll be there forever she's looking around and she can't find anything that really supports her all her whole needs for her students and herself until she meets our friendly crocodile and his name is snappy and snappy jumps up and he says i'll answer your questions i'll guide you through your journey so she's met her hero now. She's met her mentor. And she's going to be guided through her journey. So Ollie's first question is, what is phonics and how will it help my students to read? Snappy smiles. His big, big smile. And says, follow me. Now, what I would like you to do in the chat box is you to tell me what, what would your answer be to Olive. So if Olive asks you, what is phonics and how will it help my students to read, what would your answer be? Can you help Olive? Can you pretend that you are snappy? I'll just get some water. Phonics, Monica, is sound. In a nutshell, yeah, can, give me a little bit more though. How will, how will they help you? Learn to read based on letters, sound, sounds of language, between sounds and symbols, sounds of the alphabet, okay. All right, alphabet, letter, and vowel sounds, okay. Give you a couple more seconds to have a think. Ah, that's a good example, yeah. Okay, we've got a bit of pronunciation, stress. 
Okay, so what I'm seeing a lot of here is sounds, and I think that's important, isn't it? Because that's exactly what phonics is. It's the sounds of the language, right? Put together so students can read. Now, actually, don't let me tell you. I'll let I'll let Snappy tell you what sound what phonics is. So I'm going to give you Snappy's definition. Now it's going to be longer than yours. And I'd like you to try to fill in the gaps, all right? And then we'll see if you can get the same answers as Snappy. If you want to type your answers in the chat box, you can. So Snappy says, Olive, welcome to Snappy Sounds. And then we've got a gap. Something phonics forms the bedrock of learning to what and what. So I'll give you a moment. You can write in the chat box if you want to, or you can just think about it yourself, and I'll show you the answer in one minute. Good, good. We're getting there. So there's a little bit, I'll give you a clue, there's a little bit of technical language, particularly here. This is quite technical. Ah, we've got an answer for the P. Yes, and a G. And I think that's from some of our friends from Myanmar. All right, so let us check our answers. So welcome, Olive, to Snappy Sounds. And the first word is systematic phonics. S systematic phonics forms the bedrock of learning to read and spell. Now, this is what Olive needs. Olive needs a system. She doesn't need resources here and there that she can find from the internet and try and parcel together and put round pegs in square holes and so many different resources going around. What she needs is a system something that everything is in one place where she can start from the beginning of phonics till the end and take her students through that. They need to read and they need to spell. Now, reading is important because reading really is the bedrock of, I think, of, uh, of learning to master a language. If you can read well, you can generally write well, and then uh, speaking comes from that as well. Now, phonics also has a listening element where you need to recognize the sounds before you can imitate the sounds. Uh, and I'll show you how we do that within the lesson itself later on. So students require a solid foundation of the 44 phonemes. All right. So these are the sounds of the English alphabet, not the English alphabet, which has less, more, less letters, more phonemes. And then mapped to the graphemes, which is the letters that go together and represent them. And then we have snappy sounds providing this foundation and providing this system of how to teach phonics and get students to read and spell. But to, and also, sorry, I should mention, sorry, I was just having a, a computer glitch. And I should mention actually here that the counter to phonics, maybe what Bob was taught uh, how to read was the, a traditional way, the, uh, the whole world, um, sorry, the whole word look, the look and say method, natural reading, where you would sit down and someone would teach you to read by reading with you and you recognize the shapes of words. And this is counter to that. This doesn't really teach children how to read, it teaches them how to recognize patterns, whereas the phonics teaches children how to read themselves, how to decode language and words themselves. So Olive is getting a bit more of an understanding now of what phonics is, and she's really looking forward to learning more. As I said, she's a really good teacher. She wants to develop just like yourselves, and she comes across Bob one more time, spreading his negativity all over the teacher's room. And Bob says, I've told you, you're wasting your time. English is too complex to teach using this technique. 
And then he mentions goatee. He says, for example, did you know that goatee spells fish? And have you even read The Chaos by Gerald Nolst Trenet? Now, I've brought this up mainly just to, uh, just to highlight that English is a very difficult language. If you've learned English as a, as a second language, you will notice how challenging it can be sometimes. And as you as teachers have taught English, uh, you will also have taught English if it's your first language, you'll also notice how challenging it can be. And this is just a, a nice example I wanted to bring up that people might bring up when you're talking about phonics. So you've got goatee. As, as, have you seen this before, this goatee spells fish? How might goatee spell fish? So this works on sounds and shows you how, what, what a challenge. Yeah, so G-H is F. If you think of the word enough, okay, or photograph, the, G -F, the G-H sound is actually an F sound, okay? So that's the first part. So the G-H isn't G-H, it's F. The O sound is an it sound, as in women. So you've got G-H-F-O in women, which is I, and then the T-I is the sound sh that you can see in nation, okay? Nation, the T-I is a sh sound. So therefore, goatee spells fish, all right? It's a silly little example to show you how English language can be a challenge. Now, the poem, The Chaos, you can go away and Google the poem, The Chaos, and have some fun with that. Um, and it's quite a nice, interesting way of showing you the different pronunciations of certain words and how similar and how different they are when they're spelled uh, the same way. So have a look at that, but I'll let you Google that in your own time. And by the way, we will send you, or you can access all the slides at the end of today's session. I'll share it with you, and there'll also be a link uh, when the session ends, uh, giving you a link to the uh, to the to the PowerPoint. Now, how does Snappy deal with this? He's had another objection. Well, Snappy says, "Don't listen to Bob." All right, Bob's too negative. These are very low frequency words or even sounds. If you think of goatee, goatee actually isn't even a word. It's just made up to illustrate these sounds. So what snappy sounds does, it deals with the high frequency tricky words. Now, one of these tricky words, which is a high frequency word, is the, okay? If you try and break up the into the sounds, you won't get the word the, you'll get t, h, and e. If you put those together, you get t, h, you don't get the. This is a tricky sound or a tricky word that students just need to know. Now, luckily, this is a high frequency. We see the word the all the time. The word I, I, me, I, is a tricky sound, is a tricky word, okay? It's got one letter, which is I, but the pronunciation is I, or the sound is I. So, but as I said, these tricky high frequency words are dealt with very systematically within snappy sounds. You can see how they deal with them later on as students go through. Bob would have you teaching by memorization, and it's not effective. And let's look at the evidence of why it's not effective. And again, I've missed some words out. Can you test, can you tell me what these words are? And we we'll, can do this together. So if a child memorizes 10 words, the child can read only how many words? When I get the answer, I'll move on to the next one. 10 is the correct answer, correct. But if a child learns the sound of 10 letters, the ch child will be able to read how many three sound words? Thirty, all right. That's a good guess. Let's see if you are right. Sorry, 10, oh, okay, 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 so correcting the last one. How many four sounding words?
five to ten. I think he's not being too generous there. And then we've got 21,655 sounding words. So let's have a look at that. Let's look at the answers. So if a child memorizes 10 words, can only read 10 words. If a child learns the sound of 10 letters, they can write, be able to read 350 three sound words, 4,320 four sound words, etc. So you can see how learning the sounds is much more important than learning the words, of course. And this is why phonics is an effective way of teaching children how to read. And here's some more evidence. I'll give you a moment to read this yourself. My pleasure. Diphthongs, diagraphs, what lovely words they are. Or diphthongs, 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 diphthongs. That's why we need phonics to be able to read that tricky word. Okay, like I said, we're going to share the PowerPoints with you so you can um, read this to your heart's content once we get them to you as well. So Bob's back now, but he has some questions. This is all well and good, Snappy says. This is fine. You've got all this theory, but how do we put it into practice? How do we use it in the classroom? It's fine knowing that children can learn all these letters, all these sounds, but how do they do it? How do we do it as teachers? So Snappy says, let me show you. And Snappy wants to show you the resources that are available to get children reading. So let's have a look at some of the resources from this systematic program. So we start with the teacher's guide, the teacher's resource book. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment before we move on to the lesson itself. We've got decodable readers. And again, I'm going to show you the e-readers that we have available. I've got a copy of one here as well, but it's easier if I show you the e-reader. The teacher's resource pack is here as well. We've got these cool posters that you can stick on the wall of the classroom with lesson sequences, with tricky high frequency words so that students can see them. And also, um, if they can see them in the classroom, it kind of just gives them a bit of scaffolding and a bit of reinforcement. We've got these really cool placemats, which I really love, that children can put in front of them. Maybe you could laminate them. They could have their lunch whilst looking at the Snappy Sounds placemats. I actually did a similar thing for my daughter. She was learning the, the uh, periodic table, learning science. So I got a big poster of the periodic table and I laminated it. And when she's having dinner, she has to sit looking at the periodic table or she has to talk to me. Either way, it works. We have these fantastic teaching cards, which on the back have a full lesson sequence for you, if I can do it correctly a lesson sequence for you, which shows you uh, the step-by-step -step stages of the lesson, which I will also go through in a moment. And then we have these lovely little flashcards. And these flashcards help the teachers with the decoding of the words. And they're really cool. Everything is also digital as well, so you can I'll show you the digital resources at the moment. Let's have a look more at the teacher's book or the teacher's resource book before we move on to looking at a lesson in detail. So the teacher's guide has this, what we call a systematic teaching routine. Fantastic for you as a teacher and as a student because you follow a routine. Routines are great for classroom management. Routines are great uh, to make sure that you're doing the right thing over and over again. 
step-by-step -step instruction. So we have lesson plans that are available for you. So you can follow the lesson plans clearly. The scope and sequence tells you the order of the, for the, the, uh, the sounds that are introduced. Uh, these, this is very important, and we're going to look at that in a little bit of, um, more detail in a moment to see why it's important. Um, it also shows you how to make the sounds. Now, if, um, if you're not quite clear of the sound, it's going to be useless to teach the sound, right? So you need to be sure, and this, this seems obvious, and I will mention it again later, but it's not um, it's often uh, mistake, mi there's, there's mistakes made with the actual sounds of the the uh, the letters or the the phonemes or the diagraphs, the, the single uh, letters or the combination of letters, the diagraphs. And it's very important we know how to make these sounds. There is a full uh, page of uh, pictures of the mouth and, in, and instructions of how to make the sounds. There are also videos to show you how to make the sounds as well, which is really, really useful. I wasn't really, really until I started teaching phonics a while ago, I wasn't really aware of the need to do this um, and the need to make myself aware of what those sounds are. So, for example, the S sound is not S, is it? It's S. S, S that's the sound. We call it S, but we the sound is S. This kind of thing seems very obvious, but when you're teaching, you might forget to do it. So that this will help you with that. We have independent activities or practice activities um, that you can photocopy. We have sound swap activities, which I'll talk about in a moment, but basically a way to show to, to get children to spell the words uh, and dictations and obviously revision and consolidation. Now let's look in more detail at these two areas, the systematic teaching and the step-by-step -step instruction. So this systematic teaching routine, you can see here, starts with, well, there are four stages. Part one is the warm-up. Part two is the instructions and the guided practice. Part three, practice and application, and part four, review. Now you'll see in those part two and part three, we've got I do, we do, and then you do. I do is when the teacher models, it's I, me, the teacher. We do is all together. You do, the students practice by themselves, applying their understanding. You as a teacher will obviously be involved in all stages, but usually with the you do, you're checking for understanding, you're monitoring, to check that students are doing uh, what they've learned or putting what they've learned into practice correctly. And then throughout it all, you will see this continual assessment. Now, I'm not going to go into assessment too much today, but just to let you know, we have a full phonics assessment pack here, which is, like I said, it's full of resources to help you with assessing your students. Now, we're talking about continual assessment, so we're looking at assessment for learning. Excuse me. And we're looking at how, how we can um, look at the gaps that our students have in terms of the assessment rather than uh, uh, it's, it's formative assessment rather than summative. Um, and looking at how we can help our students. It's a guide for us to see what we need to develop. Olive is now getting very excited. She says it looks like an amazing program, Snappy, but she still needs to put it into practice. How does she teach it? How does she teach using this program? So Snappy, lovely, lovely Snappy says he's going to help her. He's going to take her through a lesson that helps the students practice. So are you ready? So first of all, Snappy introduces, I think you might have seen it before, the poster. Okay. Sorry, I, I just need to check. Um, something's just come up. Can you, can you all still hear and see me okay? Okay, great. Okay, sorry. 
I just had a message that said that the status had changed. Okay, lovely, thank you. So I showed you the poster before. Um, you might have not have seen it, but here we have a suggested lesson sequence. Now, as I said, and I think somebody mentioned in the chat box about routines. Let me just see if I can go back what the what person said. Uh, I agree with the idea of setting up the routines for children. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with routines in a pre-primary classroom. In fact, they are absolutely, totally important. Ledger, I will come to questions later, all right? I will, we'll have a, we will have a chance at the end and where, I, where I'll address any questions um, in the Q&A box. Thank you for that. So this systematic sequence comes, becomes familiar for you as a teacher, so it's easy for you to teach and also easy to follow for students. Um, so that both of you um, will be able, to, once, you've done, once, once you've started, the more you do this, the snappier you will become um, at teaching your phonics lesson. And let's have a look at how we put this into practice. Now, Snappy is going to let me take over here. And let's see how we do it. So here's the beginning. Now, Olive says to me, Del, tell me what to do. Now, I'm going to sing for you now. You're very lucky. Does anybody know who this lady is in the poster? It's from a movie called The Sound of Music. Any idea who she is? Yes, it's Julie Andrews. What's her name in the movie? Yeah, Leslie, Maria. So this is Maria. Now, I, my voice isn't as good as Julie Andrews, I should say. She has a, 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 an amazing voice, but I'll give you a go. So Julie Andrews, when she was teaching the children, I don't know if you can see the children at the back, she was teaching the music. She's a teacher, of course, yeah. She was teaching, she was a governess, wasn't she? She was teaching them music. And she said, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. When you read, you begin with A, B, C. When you sing, you begin with Do, Re, Mi. Thank you. I'm sure you're all clapping. So she says, when you, when you read, you begin with A, B, C. Well, I must actually tell Julie Andrews, or Maria, not Julie Andrews. I must tell Maria, you are wrong. You do not start with A, B, C when you're teaching children how to read. What do we start with? What do we start with? When we, when we learn how to read, what do we start with? We don't start with ABC. I'm telling you now, we don't start with ABC. Which sounds, Juliana, which sounds? Tell me. Tell me the sounds. We've got an S. Let's say, what are the first seven sounds? The first seven sounds. We've got one. Sam, you've got it kind of right in terms of the, uh, how we should start the, with, with the words. There we go. We've got a sati pin. Sat, sati pin. Ah. Yeah, okay. So some of you, <laughs> that's how to start singing already. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. I'm not going to go any, I'm not going to do any more singing now unless you don't answer any questions and then I'll punish you with more songs. So we use the sat pin method. But with snappy sounds, we also, you get a bonus one. We, we with snappy sounds, we're adding the phoneme m, mm, m, mm, s. Let's, let's try this together. So s, ah. Mm. It. Mm. So we've got these seven phonemes that we start with. Now, why? What's, why, why don't we teach A, B, C, or A, B, K? Why don't we teach that? Why do we teach this? Why do we use these seven phonemes to start with? What's the point? Remember, if you don't answer, I'm going to start singing. Okay, yet yeah, to spell, but we could spell if we teach ABC. 
Think about the choice of the letters. Why do we choose these sounds, these letters? Ah, that's how babies do it. Hmm, interesting. Philip, you're bang on. Yeah. So these letters we can use to make more words than we can if we teach a, b, k, d, f, g. All right. If we teach the first seven letters of the alphabet, we can't make as many words as we can from these words. All right. Have a look at this example of the words that I can make from s at m e n. Now I put those letters into a Scrabble generator, and here are the words that you can see. There's about 130 let 130 words here made from those seven letters. So it's quite a significant amount of letters that we couldn't make using the first seven letters of the or first six letters of the uh, traditional English alphabet. So that's the reason why we choose in order the sounds that you can see in the scope and the sequence. Now for today's lesson, we're going to look at mm, we're going to look at the sound all right not, not n not n but n okay that's the sound of the word all right the first thing we need to do is we need to get ready to learn so you've got 30 seconds set up your class now you will have into your in your classes you will have routines already set up but in order to get into a routine for teaching a certain um, element of your lesson, which will be hopefully phonics, you need to have um, a signal to let your students know how do you begin. So you might put up your hand. Toto, I'll come to your question in a moment. So you might put up your hand, you might ring a bell, whatever system that you have to get your students ready to learn. Then to confirm that they're ready to learn, you might have a catchphrase. So here we might have, tick tick and the student will repeat boom you might say one two three eyes on me and the students repeat one two eyes on you okay so these are general ways to get our students to recognize to offer us to recognize our students have our attention i went to cambodia and if i have any of our cambodian friends here um, and they taught me a system called class and then all the students would repeat back to them and it was amazing i didn't realize how powerful this was until i saw it used in cambodia it was about 250 teachers and everybody confirmed their attention can you just quickly tell me if you have any other ideas for confirming attention so tick tick boom tick tick students say boom one two three eyes on me students say one two eyes on you what do you use to get your students attention or to confirm their attention Any ideas? Okay, lovely, yeah, hello there, hi back, that's nice, yeah. Lovely, one, two, three, four, four, four. Oh, I like to infinity, <laughs> that's great, yeah, yeah, Toy Story. Lovely, yeah, so play around with it, good, excellent work. Yes, lovely, okay. Teacher, uh, Okay, love, 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 lovely. Oh, I like that one. Ready to listen, ready to learn. Okay, good job. I'll let you keep posting and you can keep chatting in the chat box. I'm just conscious of the time, of course, as we always are. Then this next part is our revision activity. So what we're going to do here is look at the sounds that we previously taught, okay? And you can do this by simply drilling. So using our lovely, our lovely cards that we have here, we would show these to the students and the students would say the sounds. We do this very quickly. 
or very slowly to start with and very quickly moving through them and messing around with it. Students should be already familiar with these. They've seen these sounds before. And we can move through. You can also play an omit game where you might take out one of the sounds. Okay, so here we've got set pin. Okay, sorry, we've got, let me just show you. We've got ah. Uh, Mm. It. And that will do, okay? So we've got these six sounds. Now, I'm going to remove a sound, and I'm going to shuffle up my cards. Now, the first person to tell me in the chat box which sound is missing will win a prize. Well, will not win a prize, but will be um, very proud. It, uh, tss, 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 it, uh, what's missing? Is the, cor is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you would get your students to then repeat the word, or repeat the sound that is missing. You can also play I spy games. I spy with my little eyes, something beginning with. Very simple. Um, children love I spy games and they can do it themselves. You can then show the words that you've previously taught. All right, so these are the words that we previously read. And we can go through the blending. S it, sit, okay, and show them what this blending is all about. Now, I'm going to I've put blending in red because I want to check that you understand blending. I'm going to ask you a question in a moment. And again, you can do this very slowly, getting students to recognize the words that they've read, reviewing the language that they've already been taught. And just a note, don't overwhelm them. Five or six sounds is enough. You do too many, it will become overwhelming and they won't um, be able to uh, follow. Now, if I go back to this word blending, I'm going to ask a quick question uh, to find out if you want to learn more about blending now or whether I can move on. So I'm going to put a vote on the screen. Can you answer the question? Would you like to know more about blending right now or would you want to look at it later if you already have experience? And I'll give you just a few seconds to, to vote there while I get a glass of water. All right, so we've got a clear, I think it's clearly moving towards the yes tell me now. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, I'm going to end the voting now. I think I can clearly see um what you've done there not me not that but we will need that in a moment so blending so literally what it says on the powerpoint the ability to put sounds together to make words so if we look at this one m at m at Okay, it's a very simple way of just putting the three sounds together, making one word. Now, that version one, the simple way of just segmenting each each word into the different sounds and then putting them together. We also have what we call <coughs> onset. So this is where we put the two where we where we put um, the word into two sounds. So this is a consonant vowel consonant word, as um, was mentioned earlier, CVC word, and here we have. Let me just put that down because it's confusing. We have the b, p, t, s. And then we have the onset. So the onset is this word, is the first letter. And the rhyme is the two letters together. So however, we, however way we want to put them together, we can. It's up to you. But if you were doing the onset word, let me just pull this one up again, you would have m and then ap, map, p, in, pin. 
and you put them together like that. So rather than blending three word, three letters together or three sounds together, you're blending two sounds together um, whilst also creating what we call a grapheme of two sounds together. Now, sorry, but it's obviously very important how we we know the sound of each grapheme and how to say it. So I'm going to give you a quick check in a second. Now, for the purpose of this lesson, we're going to look at the sound mm, Okay, so as we're learning to sound the sound to our right, now I'm not going to say the sound, we need to check our pronunciation. So I'm going to play you the pronunciation of this sound. And I'd like you to write in the chat box, is it one, two, or three? Number one, pin, p, i, n. Number two, pin, p, i, n. Number three, pin, p, i, n. Pin, p, i, n. Number two, pin, p, i, n. Number three, pin, p, i, n. Number four, So most of you got the correct answer, which was number one. P, I, N. N is the sound. It's not N. If it was N, it would, the word would be P, I, N, pin. All right, there's no uh at the end of the sound. We have to be careful about this when we're teaching phonics so that children can, uh, can listen to it correctly, but also then to be able to pronounce it correctly. So by learning these sounds, or being checking ourselves before we teach what the sound is, is important. And we can do that by using this really cool tool here. So our digital version of the software has this tool for us here. So I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment. I'll just share my screen and you can see so you should be able to see the N sound or the N sound and here if I click on this mm. Mm. You get a really cool example of the sound. So you can be clear yourself that you're teaching the correct sound. All right. You're not teaching the n sound, teaching the n sound, uh, the n sound. I'm getting confused myself here now. So blending is all about. Putting the, putting the letters together. And you can put them together, just to recap, in two ways, or three ways. You can put them together. If I look at these CVCs, you can put them together, B-I-N, or the B-I-N, or the B-I-N is correct. You can put them together as a onset, so you've got the B separated with the in, and then you've got the by or the bit separated with the mm. it's up to you how you put these together and how you um, blend them um, and mix it up get your students to learn different ways number two would be easier 
up to you. It's up to you how you think. Okay, we move on to actually the lesson objective. So this is part one, our warm up, and this is all about getting your students to uh, to understand why they're learning, even at this pre-primary age. I think it's really cool and important that we tell students what we are doing and why we're doing it. So here we have an example. We are learning the sound n mm, so that we can read and spell new words. And you might, in, with pre-primary, you might think about doing this in your first language or the children's first language, of course. Uh, but just to give them some idea um, about why they're there, why they're do why are we doing this, um, so that they know exactly what they're doing. And then you get them to check understanding. So you ask one or two students, what are we going to do today? And they tell everybody or they tell each other what they're going to do. This is part of warming up the students, getting them ready to learn. We then actually start hearing, seeing it and saying the, the, the sound. So we model it ourselves. This is the I do. I would say the, the sound to the students. I would then point to the picture on the card. So I would say the sound. Mm, I point to the picture. This is a, the picture on the card. Then here's the grapheme. And then we would say it together, net, mm, net, mm. And then I would ask, what's the new sound? Students repeat back to me, mm, so I can check using the nice, beautiful flashcards. After that, we, pr we practice. So we practice, this is the phonemic awareness. This is the listening side of things. We need to make sure that students are able to distinguish between the two sounds, or between, between the sound and other sounds. So here we have pictures. We've got nurse, noodles. We've got a nut. We've got tap. We've got a map. So I would say the sounds and children would then tell me whether they whether there's a n sound, a, an n sound, excuse me, I'm, I'm going a bit crazy, an n sound or, or not. So I would say the word nurse and they would put their thumb up to say yes, there's an n sound or down if there isn't an n sound. And you can be creative with this. You can do this as a TPR activity with children going to different parts of the classroom, depending on yes or no, or they can have cards, a green card is yes, a red card says no. So getting them to listen to you to check those sounds. We then have a write it. So children start to write the sound now. So you would write the grapheme on the board and you would say the sound and you would point and then say it. And children with two fingers, they can then write the sound and you might, I know I'm going backwards here, and you might say to them how to make the sound down, up and round and down, and talk to them about how the, the mechanics of writing the word. You can also play a game where they have to draw this or write the sound on, on each other's backs, and they have to uh, distinguish between maybe one or two sounds that you've written on the board. And then we move on to actually reading the words. So here we write the words on the board. Now, on the back of the teacher's card, you will see, in fact, you can see it on the PowerPoint, but you can see here the word list and the captions are highlighted for you. Students read the words on the board with your help. You would blend them together, as I, shown you, as I showed you, depending on which technique you want to use. And then you would try them with actual sentences, or what we call here, captions so tap the tin we would get them to actually read sentences skywrite it is a bit difficult if you're doing it on a screen like this because you have to go backwards but with children you can see what they're doing i think it's i think it's fine and you can guide them as well i think skywriting claret is easier than actual writing it on on a board themselves uh, there's less, it uses gross motor skills rather than fine motor skills. And then we spell it, all right? So here we have uh, you saying the word from the word list on your card here. And then we would model how we segment, how we break the word up into those different graphemes and dictate the words or the captions. And if we have mini whiteboards, which are really cool, they can write the words on the mini whiteboard. And then they can play the sound swap game. 
uh, which is a cut up letters where they have to kinesthetically spell the word and put it on the table and then move letters out uh, to show them how words can, can be put together by just changing single sounds. And then we have independent practice. So the independent practice is using the decodable readers. It's using the uh, worksheets that you see in the teacher's resource guide. And let me just show you a quick example of the decodable reader. I just need to share my screen. In fact, just to make it a little bit faster, because I'm aware of time, I'm just going to show you on camera in one of my examples. Now, this is a higher level example, but you can see beautifully, beautiful books. They're really, really nicely done, lovely illustrations. What's really cool is you can see here, there's a guide for you as a teacher. So it's kind of a guided reading program but it teaches phonics. So everything is here for you as a teacher to be able to uh, teach this uh, decodable reader. The sounds are all illustrated in the front of the book as well. So you know exactly what the sounds and what words students are going to encounter. And then they go ahead and read the book themselves. This is a bit more difficult. At the back, you will see comprehension questions. And at the, on the back page is all the details you need to make a decision of whether this book is suitable for your students or not. So it tells you the focus of the letters or the sounds. And as I said, this is level four. So this is a higher level reader than what we would be doing if we were teaching nip it, nip in the tin. And we would read this together. We would read it individually. If we have enough resources, we might be able to give copies to students to take home and read their parents. But within the first week of studying, if we, if we, if we taught the, um, the first three sounds, so if we taught the, the sat pin sound, or the first six sounds, we only need to teach the first three sounds before a student can go away and read a book by themselves. They learn very, very quickly how to read. And the books themselves, while whilst not actually having much of a story to them, because they're very, very simple, but they still give students a sense of progress that within the first week of learning, the first three or four sounds that they can go away and read a book. Parents get very, very excited by this, um, as do teachers, because uh, they want to they want to see progress from their students. Now, I'm aware that we're just going over time a little bit. If that's okay, um, I'll just keep going. I've only got a few more slides to go, um, but please bear with me. I'm sorry for just going over time. The review is very simple. We talk about what we've what we've learned in the lesson, and again, this is linked to the first start of the first part of the lesson where we um, are teaching children how to learn. So reviewing things, uh, reflecting on our learning is very important. And even if we teach them at pre-primary how to do this, it's very, very motivating and it builds a good, pr uh, a good basis for learning throughout their lives. Now, back to Olive. Olive is delighted. She thinks these books are fantastic and these resources are fantastic, particularly these teaching cards, which, as I said, have got lesson plans on the back, taking you all the way through. They're really fabulous. She's going to try it out in the class herself. She's going to tell everybody. She's even going to tell Bob. And Snappy says, my pleasure. And he says, don't forget, if you get stuck, you've got the teacher's book. You've got 
videos that you can watch on the um, online resources that will show you how the, how the, the uh, sequence of the lesson is taught. So there's lots and lots of support there for you as a teacher to be able to take you through a phonics program. If you're interested in teaching phonics, if you've got students who can't read, then think about it. This is something that could really, really have a beneficial effect on your students and on you as teachers as well. You become a very proficient teacher. And just a reminder of these resources that I looked at. So here's the lesson plan that's available to you, which you can adapt for every sound. Here are the professional development videos and the lesson sequence that you saw earlier. So really, really brilliant materials. And finally, Olive, what does she do? Olive goes back to the teacher's room and she meets Bob and she says to Bob, I've just had this, this uh, walkthrough of the material and the lessons that we can teach using phonics and we can really help our students I'm feeling very motivated. And finally, she turns Bob, Bob's frown, she turns it upside down and you'll see Bob's happy and smiling and feeling good. And so is Olive, and so is Snappy. So a happy ending by all. Now, I'm going to go to the questions, but before I go to the questions, I'm just going to show you this couple of slides. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Some people are asking about getting information. If you want information, the best place to go probably is to contact our wonderful team in Thailand, Yud Kim. Pon and our leader, Warissa, are all waiting to hear from you if you have any questions. I myself, if you've got any questions about teaching phonics, if I didn't make anything clear and you need to know a little bit more, get in touch. I'll, come, I'll try and help you. I'm always here for, for teachers across uh, Asia. So please don't, no question is a, is, a, is a question that I won't be able to answer. I'm sure I'll be able to help you with some things. If you want to... Follow us on Facebook to get more information. Have a look here. If you want to join our Teachers Club where you get regular newsletters giving you information, then please have a look at the uh, link here. And as always, I myself am really interested to know what you think about the session. So I really appreciate it if you can do the survey. The survey is very important to us. It really helps us moving forward to help you as we go through the session. So thank you so much for your help. Now, I'll put the, the survey link into the chat box as well so you can see that. Let me just get that. Here's a link to the survey. Oh, does anybody have any questions? Let me go to the Q&A. Right. T can be a sh... Okay, let's have a look at that. I have a question. If you don't mind, Dell, how should I tell my students about the tricky words that can be read through phonics so they don't confuse between both? So, Lydia, this will... You will see this as you work through the, um, the material. In the... Um, in the read on the readers that you are the decodable readers you will see that the tricky words are highlighted here so it says it says tricky high frequency words so these are the words that students will need to know at this level this is level four okay so they might have seen these words before high frequency obviously means that they're, they're everywhere. When we're looking at level one, which was what we looked at before with these sat pin words, our tricky words will be words such as the, I, and maybe a, ah, which is a schwa sound sometimes. So all you need to do is make them, just make them aware of them um, and, and learn them as you would do the other sounds. So instead of learning the as a, as a, as a, a blend, you can't blend the, you can only learn it as the. So you would just teach it as one single word. So go back to the traditional way of te teaching it by, um, by, by memorizing that word.
Now, Toto, you said no. Those seven, those seven letters are not unique to English. They're just the the words. Um, if we think about, if you compare it with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those seven or those six or seven letters will not generate as many words as S A T P I M N. That's why we choose S A T P. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying the correct sounds. I know that. But that's why we choose those letters, because we can generate more words using those letters than we can if we teach systematically through the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Ah, the online survey. Well, that sorry, I can't really answer that question. It's kind of uh, the online surveys through the actual platform that we used. The platform, by the way, is obviously, as you know, it's called Click Meeting, um, and it's just. This comes comes with the platform. So the series are available. Just get in touch with us at the information you can see on the screen. The difference between a and eh always confuse us. Well, that's just going to be coming with uh, with practice. I mean, there are different, obviously, different sounds uh, for each of those um, letters. And it depends on 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 what letters they go with as well. Um, so that's something you just have to work through as you work through with the phonics. Nathan, the appropriate student age starting phonics. It, it's pre-primary, so as soon as they can uh, uh, recognize, I think it, it, it's kindergarten foundation level is usually this the stage. If you're if you're uh, learning as a first language, you you would lose you would start at foundation level, uh, which is kindergarten. So, um, as soon as they can, as soon as you you can recognise that they can actually uh, recognise letters and understand what they what they actually are, and that they do refer to a sound. So this symbol refers to a sound. Once they start doing that, then you can start getting them uh, getting them hooked onto phonics. So I think I just answered that, Robert, with the uh, and uh, yeah, is four years old too young for tuition? Again, Nathan, like I said, it's going to depend actually on the learner themselves. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's yeah, it's going to be addressed by the teacher. And I think if you look at the, uh, the phonics assessment, the diagnostic tool there, but also getting them, uh, like I said, if, if students can recognize that a symbol is related to a sound, then essentially they're reading in that respect and you can get them started systematically on uh, on phonics. Yes, you can buy it. Yes, you just have to get in touch with uh, Macmillan Education here. And maybe Kim or you, you can jump in or pat upon, you can jump in here and help these people if they've got questions about accessing the materials. And before we go, we also have a session on Speak Your Mind coming up on the 7th of October. I'll just flick to that slide to show you. We have a session coming up, which is for teachers who are teaching adults or adult teachers. Um, but if you are teaching primary and secondary, I'm sure you could get some ideas as well. So you're, everybody's welcome. But please look out for uh, the uh, the next session that's coming up. Juliana, what do I think about Jolly Phonics? Well, Jolly Phonics is a competitor product. Um, and I don't want to be too disparaging about Jolly Phonics. Jolly Phonics is, an, is a very traditional, very old um, product now. It's been in the market a long time. Some people like it, some people not so much. But I can say about Snappy Sounds, this product is brand new. It was published last year in Australia. It's, it's, it's the newest phonics program that I know of. And it's, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just better in many, many ways. Okay. If 
nobody has. Oh, there we go. How can this program be taught in a 30 plus student class? Well, I don't think there's. I don't think there's. Oh, that's nice to know, Juliana. Thank you. I don't think with a, with a class of 30, I think. I think it's, it's very, very, very possible that you can teach phonics with a class of 30. But your classroom management has to be on, you know, has to, you have to be very good with the classroom management. If you've got 30 pre-primary students learning how to read, then all you need to do is have those routines um, of classroom management. That's going to be your first um, challenge. Um, once you've got your classroom management down, then you can start introducing new uh, techniques or new new uh, new things to the class, such as phonics. And then within the phonics, as I mentioned, we have routines. So students following routines, hopefully, will follow the classroom management within those routines. So I don't see why you can't teach it with 30. You just need to have pretty good classroom management skills. Yvonne, with teenagers, you'd be looking at people who are really... Um, who, who would be challenged with their read, or who haven't studied English before, then, then I think you could, but you would probably need to just make sure that they know that obviously the material, the content, the books are designed very much for younger learners. However, when I was starting to learn Thai, one of the things that I did was, was start to read Thai. And one of the first things that I started to read was children's books. Um, and I found it very, very helpful uh, because the language was a bit simpler. So you could use it with teenagers, but I would be very careful that you understand that teenagers might need a bit of guidance as to why you're using a product that was uh, that was aimed at, at very, very young learners. So just a bit of discussion about that. Teenagers would probably get through it very quickly, much quicker than a, than a pre-primary student because they would have other skills that they bring to the table, but it might be helpful for them to learn those sounds. All right, if you've got any more questions, I will leave the, uh, I will leave the page up for a, for a moment um, and you can contact me directly with any questions. Um, but thank you all so much for your time. You will receive a certificate um, or you can get a certificate um, and that will be sent in a link to you after this session. So thank you so much for all your time. And uh, I hope to see you again on the 7th of October at the same time, same place. Take care.